before we go uh, and start the process to show everybody, I have a question. It says, um, if you're running a much older version, should you upgrade to an immediate version first if that's too old? Let's talk about that after we run the update because that's a good question and there is some information I do want to give you all. So I just wanted to show you all that the virtual IP address at the auto failover is functioning. So what I'm going to do is go right back to the iSCSI auto failover. Here's our target. Everything's running. And it's consistent. Node is now active. And what I want to do is I'm going to manually fail over to the secondary passive server, which will promote itself as the active server. So let's go back to make sure that our target is still visible. We see that we're pinging the virtual IP address. And we'll do a continuous ping. Data is still being accessed. So you can see that we're still accessing the target. The virtual IP address is still communicating. Now let's verify it's in suspend mode, which is what we want to we want to be in. Now if we look at the destination, it provides us a warning and it is now active. So let's go ahead and do our update. So we want to go to the maintenance software update. We want to make this the default. Now we can go ahead and restart. So we're restarting this system right now. Once we come back up, we will then uh, be able to switch and fail back over and then update the secondary. So what this is showing is that you're still providing high availability uptime when doing updates or even if you're doing scheduled maintenance. Let's say you want to be able to add more components on the server, add maybe some 10 gig NICs and you need to bring that system down so you want to fail over. Now let's say you wanted to do the secondary. Uh, in the secondary you could stop the service in the secondary and then be able to bring that up and your virtual IP address and your target will still be available so there won't be any downtime. So the primary server uh, will still continue the run. If you want to do it the reverse, just do it like the way we have done. Manually fail over to the secondary system, and then you can work on that primary system. So going back to uh, the question that we have, is if you're running a much older version, should you upgrade to the immediate version uh, first if it's too old? Um, if you're running a version called 3537, we have an upgrade path where you need to get up to uh, build. Uh, there's a small update that a small file that allows you to get up to 4023. Once you're on that 4023 version, then you can update right up to the latest version. Well, it'll take you to 4622. And the reason for that was that there were a lot of scripts and changes uh, between those versions. Once you're at 46.22, then you can go to 47.86. You can, if you, let's say you did maintenance miscellaneous and you saved your settings. So if we go into maintenance miscellaneous, you know you've saved your settings. You can actually uh, use the USB flash stick. Put DSS v6, the latest version, on there. So if we were to download the zip file, put the latest version on a USB flash stick, reboot the system, and do software installer, yes, you could do it that way. Um, many engineers do that. They don't like to do multiple um, updates as it could take time. Um, but this also is, can be inconvenient due to because, let's say you're at a, your system's at a data center, and you can't actually get to the system or it's an hour away or two hours. In that case, you're going to have to do the small updates. And if you email me uh, or at the end of the session after the recording is uh, completed, I'll uh, update on the chat window and provide you that update information. So just stay tuned at the end and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. And one of the things is, is that with the USB flash stick, a lot of engineers now are basically they're installing the DSSV6 on a 2 gigabit volume. 
And then they use the USB flash stick as well as an alternative backup solution. So let's just say for whatever reason, logically or physically, the DSS is uh, faltering. Somehow maybe the RAID controller is having an issue, um, but you've got another volume or another unit that's functioning on another RAID controller. You can reboot the system. And if you have, let's say, an IPMI or a keyboard video mouse, access that and leave that in there, and you'll be able to use the software installer and reinstall or boot off the USB flash stick and continue working until you figure out uh, what issues that we're causing. So it's a nice alternative dual operating system or hot standby operating system uh, in case something happens or you want to do updates. So a lot of uh, engineers are doing this now, and they find that it's very uh, comforting to know that uh, that there's a dual st hot standby operating system of DSS v6. A lot of them will continuously update their USB flash sticks and leave them in the system. And it's not harmful. I mean, you got to remember, DSS is running in memory. Uh, it's not running on what you're seeing here is the Apache and the Linux that's underneath there. So what's happening is when we boot up, we're running all our operating system all on memory. When you look at the, uh, in the logical volume manager, in, in here, you'll see that there is a reserved pool. Uh, once we load this up, I'll show you that, you know, the reserve pool, what it does do, it's, it cars out four gig. Um, it's like reserve for swap. And uh, you can actually, you don't really need this. Many times you can remove it uh, for desperate situations where you need that extra space. Uh, and it helps you buy some more. Maybe for a snapshot, you just need one gig more. And you can recreate your reserve pool again. But you would need to have enough space. Uh, you want to leave at least two gig for your reserve pool. But you can borrow against it. Just make sure you recreate it again. Uh, this is reserved for the system. So what's, what's created here is a one gig partition, virtual partition on the uh, unit itself. And that's storing the configuration. Other than that, the set setup and the configuration are stored separately. The setup, all the uh, things and functions that are stored, the IP address, the password, that's stored on the DOM or the USB flash stick or in your two gigabit volume that you've created on the RAID set. The configuration is stored on the virtual uh, partition that's created for the reserve for system. So that's everything that's dealing with the configuration of the volume manager, the NAS settings, and things of that nature. So even if you do lose, for whatever reason, uh, the reserve for system, you can always get it back. You can always create your targets, just recreate them again, and assign the LUN numbers to them. Also, for your NAS shares, many times I get this, is that if there's a catastrophe in an environment, that if you just go to specified path and recreate it because your share is not available. Um, here, let's say we were to, um, for whatever reason, it is gone. Let's say this is not here. You can always go to in shares, specify path, and recreate it here and type in data and then hit apply and save it and then your share will come back up. So even if you do lose your configuration you can always pull it up. And that's the beautiful thing about DSS is being running out of memory that your data is fine. So the RAID controller's job is to make sure that you're properly set up for your RAID controller. One of the things we talked about on the the fiber channel things is that with the new version here on the old version 4622 I can only set it for target or initiator mode that's all I can do with the new version that we're going to update and I'll show you is that you could set one of the ports for the QLogic 2462 one for target and one for initiator and we now have MPIO for fiber channel we have a blog that talks about it and we have incredible performance speeds that uh, please view and, and look at that because it's, it's very interesting to look at those speeds Let's see if our servers come back up. And it is. And we want to verify also our data on the 2003 system is still good. So what we'll do is we'll first get everything synced up. You can see now I'm on 4786. And let's go ahead with the yeah, ISCSI failover. 
It's still in suspend mode. Now we want to go to our secondary active server. We see that's active. So now what we want to do so we can update the secondary system is we want to sync volumes. And this only takes a few seconds. And then what you do is you come back up here and kind of verify. You see that the reverse volume replication, it's running, it's consistent. So it looks pretty good right now. And now we'll be able to fail back. Now let's take a look at the server. We're still pinging the virtual IP address. We're still connected to the target. We're still able to access the files for that target. And we're failing back in progress. So give this a second. Let's go over to our source, the original source. And we see that it's, it's getting upgraded. It's running the replication. It's verifying. It sees that the volume is consistent. And now it's back to its original position. So the primary is back to its original position. It's been updated. But now we can go ahead and proceed with updating the secondary passive server. So we want to go back into the failover status. You see that it's updated itself, that it's secondary passive. And now we're going to go ahead, scroll down, and we're going to update them. Uh, what we need to do is just stop the service. And as you can see, the ping is still working. Now let's go ahead and bring up the, the data for it. Let's go to my computer, and we see D drive. So we still see our files. Service is now stopped. You can see here it's stopping. And now it's inactive. So now we can go with our software update. Select the 4786. And now we can reboot. So in the event that the um, that you're able to at any time that you need to do maintenance, that the auto failover feature is really worth having. I see a lot of people talk about, well, I have a RAID 6, so I shouldn't have to worry. And you never know what could happen. When you provide, a, when you reduce a single point of failure, uh, having an additional DSSV6 used in an auto failover environment is really important and necessary. Data is very expensive to get back or very expensive if lost. So, and time is of the essence. Today we're seeing that time is the big issue. Uh, how long does it take to restore? Sure, it's easy to back up, but to restore time can take, take a while. So having the auto failover feature to work for you in this kind of situation or any other type of situation for updates or maintenance or disasters, uh, recovery plans, it's, it's really a good idea to look at getting another DSS v6. So now that uh, we're rebooting the server, we'll come back up, and then we can look at the uh, fiber channel uh, target and initiator mode. One of the things uh, I want to talk about on the auto failover is, you know, there's a difference of, um, and I caught myself doing this as well, is I had a, the virtual IP address uh, on the same subnet as another uh, NIC that I had. So I had 3. Dot, let's say 220. And the you want to make sure that you don't do that. We specify that that uh, it's on a separate um, subnet and then from the physical IP address that, that's on one of your NICs. So let's say ETH4 was 3.210 for whatever reason. You want to make sure that you change that Ethernet uh, to a different subnet or a different network. So you want to keep your virtual IP addresses separate. 